In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we come, to, we come to you humbly, recognizing our sins, our weakness. In the need of your grace, please send the Holy Spirit so that he may guide this talk, that he may shed light so that we can see how the capital sins work in our lives, have dominion over us, and give us the strength to find freedom from them. Amen. So, this is um, our third talk. We're close to the middle of the retreat. So I know that the first talk with Father David was about pride. And I heard a very interesting expression about pride. Um, the author said that pride was like the snake below all of the other snakes. Like all of the other capital sins are snakes in, in themselves. But pride is the snake beneath all of the snakes. And the previous talk was about lust. And this third talk is going to be about a capital sin that is closely related with lust. We will see how are they related. And we're going to talk about gluttony. Gluttony. So I want to open this talk with a question. I already asked this question to the men from my small group. So if the men from my small group know the answer, let's abstain from answering. Let's give other people a chance. What are the three things in life that are more pleasurable? What are the three most intense pleasures in life? Who wants to say something? Okay, joking. Tell me something that is very pleasurable in life. Don't be afraid. <laughs> okay. That's pleasurable, but let me rephrase my answer, my, my question. Let's think about the corporal pleasures. Okay, sex. What else is extremely pleasurable and we all, we all enjoy doing? Eating and drinking. We all enjoy eating and drinking. And what is the third thing that we all enjoy doing that has to do with our corporal pleasure? Sleep. Sleep. So look at, look at the whiteboard. Sex, eating and drinking, sleeping. All of, like, the three are very, very exciting, very pleasurable. Obviously, the most intense pleasure of all is that of sex. But all three are very pleasurable. Why has God made these three things so intensely pleasurable? Because those three things are needed for what? Survival. Survival and preservation of the species. If you do not eat and drink, you do not survive. If you don't sleep, you don't survive. If humans don't have sex, the species doesn't survive. So God, in his infinite wisdom, has related pleasure, an intense pleasure with this, with, with this Three things that are needed for survival, right? They are all pleasurable because they are all related with survival. So the question is, is it bad to experience pleasure in any of these three things? Is it bad when we enjoy e eating? Is it bad when in the intimacy of those married couple, there is pleasure among spouses? Is it bad that we find pleasure in sleep? No. God has wanted there to be pleasure in these things, so he can guarantee in this way the preservation of the species. It's okay, and it's good, and we should celebrate pleasure in its right place. 
But what is the problem? The problem is that after original sin, there is disorder in human being, and we start seeking for these things in a, in a disordinate way, without order. These pleasures attract us and pull on us so, so, with so much intensity that we start seeking for them without order. So there is a virtue, there is a virtue that allow us to seek these pleasures in a reasonable way and in a way that leads us to God. What is the name of that cardinal virtue that, help, that helps us relate with what is pleasure in a smart way? Who can tell me? What's the name of that cardinal virtue? Temperance. temperance. So after original sin, temperance is the virtue that allows us to choose these things within the confines of reason and within the confines of reason illuminated by faith. So the virtue that helps us relate adequately with sex, eating, drinking, and sleep is the virtue of temperance. And the virtue of temperance is absolutely necessary for salvation. We need temperance for salvation. I spoke with my small group about this, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give the chance to one of the small groups to answer, but this pool that we find in ourselves that, that, that pulls us to seek pleasure without reason, this pool that we find in us is one of our spiritual enemies. It's a, spirit, it's a spiritual enemy that's within us. Brian, do you remember what's the name of our spiritual enemy? We, we've talked about three spiritual enemies, and one of those is the one that pulls us towards pleasure without reason. What's the name of that spiritual enemy? So it's not the devil, it's not the world, it's... But the technical word is? Flesh. Flesh. So flesh pulls us to seek these three things besides the consideration of reason, because flesh, flesh is the desire to seek for pleasure without limits. I'm going to repeat this because I think it's important. Flesh is a spiritual enemy within us that pushes us to seek pleasure without limits. So temperance is the virtue that helps us to regulate the desires of the flesh. So when you spoke about lust, what is lust? Lust is the vice that makes you seek for sex or for the pleasure of sex outside of the order of reason and faith. Gluttony is the vice that makes you seek eating and drinking outside of, the, of what's reasonable. So St. Thomas of Aquinas, he says, what is gluttony? Gluttony is a disorder, is a disordered affection for eating and drinking. That's gluttony. It's when we have an affection for seeking that pleasure outside of the confines of reason and what's appropriate. So, <clears throat> why is lust and gluttony so difficult to, let's say, control? Because it is hard to distinguish when it is reasonable and when I'm, and when I'm la like moving from what is reasonable to what is excessive. Because both are necessary for survival. So that's why they're hard to, co to, to, to contain because they're necessary for survival, but sometimes they just like exceed the place for, from, from what is reasonable. Okay, so 
Why is it important to speak about gluttony? It's important to speak about gluttony because when we don't control our pleasures, our pleasures begin to control us. That is why it's so important to speak about capital sins. Because when we don't have a hold over these tendencies, these tendencies start to have a hold over ourselves. So what is this talk about? This talk is an invitation for you to examine in your own conscience how is it that the desire for eating and drinking and the desire for other sorts of entertainments and other sorts of indulgences are starting to get a grip on me. So listen to this incredible quote from, Saint, from Pope St. Leo the Great. Listen to this. He's very smart in this quote. He says, when you have a lion and you pet a lion, it could happen that when you pet the lion, you can domesticate the lion. We've all seen maybe those videos on YouTube when the owner finds again his lion and they hug and such. So it is possible that when you pet the lion, you domesticate the lion. St. Leo the Magno says, with the flesh, it's the other way around. The more you pet the flesh, the more it becomes a beast impossible to control. The more you indulge with your flesh, the more you concede to the demands of your flesh, the more the flesh becomes a beast impossible to control. And that is true about lust, and that is true about gluttony. And that is why, brothers, If we want to be chaste, we have to be temperate first. And if we want to be temperate, we also have to be chaste. Because when you come to think about it, look, it's so interesting. Lust and gluttony are so related because in the end, if you are temperate, you'll be able to dominate these two tendencies. The same virtue governs both bad tendencies. And that's why these two tendencies are so related among them. And in fact, they are so related, when you come to think about it, many times. I hope this won't make us do images in our head. Let's try not to do images, but many times. When we talk about sex, we talk about sex with eating language. And that's how closely related they are. Because if you don't dominate one, you won't be able to dominate the other. So the question is, next question, right? How do, we, how do you sin against gluttony? There are different ways in which you can sin against gluttonies. Normally we think gluttony is eating too much or drinking too much. But Aquinas teaches us there are more than one way that we sin against gluttony. So we're gonna, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a list so you guys can later do an examination of conscience and see like, in, in, in what way you're sinning against gluttony. So the first way he says that you can sin against gluttony is when you eat or when you drink with excessive passion and excessive, let's say, um, there's a word that escapes me. Armando, ¿cómo se dice? Avidez. Con excesiva avidez. Federico. Néstor. Okay. Yeah. When you eat with excessive desire. So for example, we've all met someone who maybe eats excessively fast, right? Like you sit down with a table with him, you're eating, you turn to, to, to his seat and he's already done with his food, right? So it's when we eat or when we engage with eating or drinking with excessive passion, when we eat excessively like fast. And this is interesting, brothers, you know why? Because this is a reminder that food is much more about just feeding yourself, but food is also related with so many aspects of human life. Food is related with sharing. Food is related with fraternity. Food is related with building family bonds. 
Food is relating with being grateful. Food is relating with learning to share with others. And I guess this is a place for me to, you know, guys, you as head of families, you guys are in charge of being able to set up meals in your house that work in a good way. You guys are responsible for setting up meals that really make it a place for the family to come together in conversation, in gratefulness, in sharing, in building bonds. And sometimes we've made out of meals something so practical, like each one grabs his meal and goes to his bedroom to eat his own meal with a TV. But meal is called to be something very different. Meal is called to be a place for family building. So I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but I think it's still you know, useful to mention this. Catholic men, you are supposed to run your family. And one of the important places where you build your family is in the daily meals. And being able to set up properly a meal where everyone can share, everyone can bring something to the meal. So the first way in which we sin against gluttony is when we eat with excessive passion. Second way in which we sin against gluttony when we eat between meals without necessity i know that nowadays you know we hear a lot about the importance of having five meals a day or six meals a day or seven meals a day and i'm i'm not against it and i'm not and i don't know more than people who study those things i mean i'm not a nutritionist and i'm not a scientist but a way that you can sin against gluten is just eating more frequently than you need. That's the point, is eating with more frequency than you really need. Third point is when you only want to eat things that are exquisite and perfect. And I think this is also, this, let's take a little detour, but I think this is also important, guys, for you to remember that you're supposed to teach your kids that they, that they should eat everything, not only what they like, but they're supposed to eat everything. And sometimes we can also fall in the sin of gluttony when we say, I don't eat that, I only enjoy eating this. Obviously there's people, you know, maybe out of health issues there are things you have to avoid, but our general disposition, a general expression of the virtue of temperance is being able to eat everything everything that, that's put in front of you. Fourth way. When we eat excessively, or when we drink excessively. And again, I want to bring back that point, right? Why is it important to speak about gluttony? Why is it important? Because it's a place where you're called to exercise your self-dominion. If gluttony guides your life, if gluttony dominates your life, then it's much harder for you to dominate your passions in other aspects of your life. Brothers, when we cannot refrain ourselves from eating more than we need, that is just an expression of how weak our will can be. And how drawn to other passions is, is gonna is gonna um, and how drawn to other passions is our will gonna be? Next point: When does the sin of gluttony become a mortal sin? When does the sin of gluttony become a mortal sin? It becomes a mortal sin. For example, when I drink excessively and I become drunk. I'm going to give you a definition of drunkenness that I think is useful. And this is not an invitation to drink like all the time, a lot, just, as, just in as much as I'm not drunk. But drunkenness means to lose your senses. That is what makes, like, that's the threshold where you um, 
get into mortal sin when you have lost your senses. So a way in, you can, in which gluttony becomes a mortal sin is when you are drunk. It's also, it also becomes a mortal sin when you cannot refrain from eating the things that you know are not good for you and can really um, hurt your health. So for example, they may, there, there may be people who have, you know, maybe they're diabetic and they know they have to avoid sweets, but their passion for eating is so big that even when they know that it, this is going to be hurting their health, they cannot refrain and they choose only for the sake of pleasure, even when it's detrimental for their health. So the second way in which gluttony becomes a mortal sin is when you choose to eat, even when you know this affects gravely your health. It also becomes a mortal sin when the church teaches that it's a day of fasting and abstinence, and we choose to eat more than we're called to on the days of fasting or abstinence. When it's day an abstinence and we choose to eat meat just because of the sake of wanting to eat something that we enjoy, that could also become a mortal sin. Okay, so why is, it, why is gluttony called a capital sin? I think Father David already explained this, but what makes a capital sin a capital sin is because it's head of many other sins. That's why it's called a capital sin, because it's mother of many sinful daughters. And this is especially clear, brothers, when it comes to the excess of drinking. Because it's easy to think in how many sins are related with the excess of drinking. The first and perhaps more clear to all of us is that drinking is very related with lust. Because when we are drunk or under the effects of alcohol, we are much more prone to be led by our instincts than by our reason. In the confessional, how many times I hear people saying like, I drank too much the other evening, and then, you know, I saw it for pornography or masturbation. Because that's what happens. That's why it's a capital sin. Because it's a sin that leads you to other sins. I think that, you know, one of the daughters also of gluttony, of the excess of drinking, is that not only, you know, it could lead us to something like pornography or masturbation, but also like, um, you tend to be a little bit like, like excessively loquacious, like you speak too much, you say things that you're not supposed to say, you're less prudent. Sometimes we start being a little bit flirty with other women when we shouldn't be. We start like breaking boundaries. And all of this are capital sins. I mean, that's why we call it a capital sin, right? Because it, it opens the doors for so many other sins. But we also could say it's a capital sin because the excess of eating and drinking can also disturb your health. We're supposed to take care of our bodies. We're supposed to cherish the temple of the Lord that is our body. And sometimes the excess of eating and, and drinking can really affect our health. How many he health related issues, how many health related issues with the excess of eating and drinking? Yes, Armando. It's, it's, it's always also related to the complete opposite. How so? Like not eating, not drinking. Yeah, yeah. That's also, I mean, that's also a form of, of gluttony but I'm not addressing it because it tends to be much less mm -hmm. frequent. It's also a form of gluttony, for example, not wanting to eat because I want to look in, at the, like in a certain way, but I, maybe this is more common among women. So I wasn't going on that direction because I want to you know, address what I think is more um, common among men, right? So it's also, you know, we have to ask ourselves like, Maybe, maybe the fact that I don't control my eating and drinking, it's related with, you know, I'm overweight, I have health issues, 
And it's just like a, an evidence of my lack of self-ownership, right? And together with this, I want to do like a, a small detour because I think that the virtue of temperance and in a way the sin of gluttony is also related with, let's say, when we seek, when we're gluttonous when it comes to entertainment. And I think this is also a type of gluttony that we should be aware of. What do I mean? Today, I don't know if for good or for wrong or, or for bad, maybe more for bad than for good, we have such a huge amount of options for entertainment at hand that we should really ask ourselves today, how well do, we, do I manage the entertainment that I have available for me? Like for example, I guess that most of us have Netflix in our house, right? So, you know, most of you are either my age or older, but I was, you know, when I was growing up, we had cable. So if you wanted to see a movie, like you had to wait for the movie. But now everything is available, right? Everything is available. And I think that this has to do with temperance because we have to ask ourselves, how well do I manage my desire and my gluttony for entertainment? And why do I say this? It's because sometimes we want to watch a TV show or a TV movie, and I think that it's reasonable when we have had a long day. But again, this comes in under the idea of temperance. Because sometimes I think this is not going to affect necessarily our health, but maybe our desire for entertainment gets in the way of other important things. Like for example, are we spending enough time with our kids? Are we spending enough time with our wife? Are we speaking enough with our wife? Are we having enough conversation with her as we should? Or are we numbing ourselves looking for entertainment? Are we spending too much time in social media? Am I looking too much at Facebook, scrolling unnecessarily? Am I, look, am I spending too much time on Instagram? I think that this is also a form of gluttony for entertainment. So I think there's a big space there where you can ask yourself, am I using entertainment and my devices in a smart way, in such a way that really helps me build a stronger family and a stronger relationship with God. So I'm just going to leave there, this point there so you can you know, examine your conscience before the Lord. Brothers, we're called to holiness. We're called to be holy men. We're not, to, we're not called only to be not so bad, above average, not as bad as the common men. We're called to be holy. And when we do our examination of conscience, you have to ask yourself, the choices that, are, that I am making when it comes to entertainment, are they really choices that build me up, build up my family, build up my relationship with God? How many times, and I know, I don't want to be unfair with this question, okay, but how many times do we seek first our entertainment than our prayer time? I don't want to be unfair, because I know that it's good for you guys to have a distraction after a long day of work. But think about it, how many times we choose first to indulge in ourselves before seeking God? And I think that can be a form of gluttony. Me first, me first, I want this, I want to be distracted, I'm so stressed, I need a relaxation. <laughs> that's fair and that's okay. But do you also find a time for things that are even more important? Okay, so last point of this talk. How are we supposed to cultivate the opposite, the, the, the opposite virtue, like the virtue that opposes gluttony, the virtue of temperance? How, do we, how are we supposed to you know, work on this virtue? 
So the first thing is, we have to learn and we have to remember that we have to deny ourselves. And I want to share something with you that happened to me recently and I think was very, very good that happened to me. So I went to confession. I hope Father David is not around. I went to confession with Father David and he gave me a really good penance. He, he asked me, do you have at least one act of abnegation or mortification every day? He asked me that. Like, do, do, do you plan an act of mortification or abnegation every day? And I said, Father, I'm ashamed to say this, but I don't have it. And he told me, do a schedule and lay out in that schedule at least one act of mortification every day. So what are the type of things that I prepare in the schedule? I'm giving up sweets, desserts, snacks, chocolates that I really enjoy several days a week. And you know what? I feel so happy that Father David gave me that penance. I feel so happy. I feel so joyful that I'm starting to exercise myself in saying no to myself. And you know what you discover when you say no to yourself? That you say yes to yourself in so many occasions that you don't really need it. How many times I chose to have desserts and it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with desserts, right? Especially, I don't know, if you're, if you're Wife, you know, she made cookies and such. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. But sometimes, you know, this penance just opened my eyes to say, wow, how many times I'm choosing to say yes to things I really don't need? So there, there, there's a distinction that, that, that we have to make. When we give up on things that are not necessary, but they are okay, like things that are not necessary, but they are, let's say, they're not sinful in themselves. That's what we call uh, an act of, let's say, mortification. But when you give up on the necessary, that's called penance. When you give up, so for example, giving up on a dessert, that's an act of mortification. But when you skip a meal, a meal, that's an act of penance. So what I'm calling you guys to do is, at least we have to strive for mortification. We have to strive to be able to tell ourselves no in the things that are not sinful in themselves, but not really necessary. Because that helps us build the virtue of temperance. And we need the virtue of temperance. Let me give you uh, a couple of other let's say, more practical tactics or strategies. For example, every time that we have a meal, make sure you bless the meal. Make sure that you order the meal to God's greatest glory. Make sure that you never omit a thanksgiving after the meal. I'll give you, I'll give you other examples that I think are good. I don't know, if you're doing cooking or maybe if, if, if it's not meal time, it's before meal time and you go through the kitchen and you see like, oh, there's a meal, so I wanna grab something before, you know, like Spanish, we say picotear, you know, like you wanna, quiero picotear algo. And then I come back for the meal. No, don't grab anything. Exercise yourself in mortification. Exercise yourself in self-dominion. Another, well, this doesn't apply exactly to your life, but I'm still gonna share with it. Like, it was a good act of, of, of mortification. In the novitiate, uh, we were always hungry, right? Because we were doing so many things. What was the act of mortification? Abstain yourself from asking what's gonna be there for, for lunch or for dinner. Don't ask, don't ask. Mortify your curiosity, right? So all of these practices they are necessary for our lives and they're good for our lives. Another important practice, I think this is very useful, listen to this. What we should strive to do is, we should strive to reduce what we eat until the point where we really find what we have to eat. Because I think that we normally eat much more than we really need. So a good practice is reduce, 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 reduce until your body tells you, oh, oh no, I need, I need a little, bit, a little bit more, right? That would be good. Other things is, 
And I think this is going to be something useful for you guys. Never complain of the food. Never. Never complain. Especially when other people did the food for you. <laughs> Always be grateful. Never say, you know, I don't enjoy this. I don't like this. We've, I don't know, I, I know we've, we've shared many times this example with you guys, but I'm going to share it again. You know what's an act, a good act of fortification? When the food is a little bit not so tasty, don't add salt to the food. Be able to eat the food even when the food is not perfect. But what's my point? I think we should really, if we really want to grow spiritually, if we really want to strive for holiness, we have to make mortification a part of our lives. And I want to bring it back to the example I gave you yesterday. Prayer and self-denial. Well, what's our problem with prayer if there's no self-denial? That prayer is a weak prayer. What happens when there's self-denial but there's no prayer? You, you want to be a stoic, and that's great, but that's not Christian. We have to join, we have to bring together both things. So now that you that we're departing for a moment of prayer, I want to give you a couple of places in the Bible that you can look into. Maybe once you've gone through the points and you've meditated and you've, and you've looked into your own life, I want you to look at an interesting story from the Bible. Genesis 25, <coughs> verse 29 to 34. It's the story of Jacob and e Esau about a plate of lens. Maybe you guys remember that story. Look at that story. Look at the, read that story from the perspective of the capital scene of gluttony. And you'll find a lot of interesting insights. I also want to invite you to go to the letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 19, verse 19 to 21. You can also go to how do you say? Como se dice Galatas? Galatians, Galatians chapter five, verse twenty-one. Yeah, and also the book of Proverbs, chapter twenty-eight, verse seven. Okay, so, you know, what's the point of each of these meditations? This is not a moral theology class. It's true that we get to learn a little bit of moral theology, but this is not a moral theology class. The point is that we receive this talk, and we go into a chapel, so we can take this talk and bring it to my life. So I can see where I'm failing. So I can see where I'm being dominated by the sin of gluttony. Only when, get, when you get to know yourself, only when you get to know your sins and your misery, there can be a start for, you know, there can be space for change. If you do not, if you do not know yourself, you won't be able to change. So the idea is bring these points to a chapel, bring them to prayer. Remember, this is a way I think you should this is what you should strive for. You should strive to learn these points so you could do a, you know, like a class after you're done with a whole retreat. You should learn these points so well that you could do a class when you leave the retreat. But at the same time, you should bring these points so much to your own life that, you, yeah, that you're able to identify how this capital sin has dominion over you. But you should pray, you should pray so intensely that you call on the Lord so, so that he can bring you to a place of Freedom from these capital sins. And let me, let me finish with this. I think that we, as we look to each capital sin, we should also look at Christ. Because in Christ, we have the greatest example of humility, the greatest example of chastity, the greatest example of temperance and sobriety. Not only look at, your, at yourself, but also 
take the time to look at Jesus and to look at how he was able to, you know, really not only die for our sins, but also with his own life shows, show us an example of what we're called to be. That's it. That's it. In Christ, with his life, is calling us to where you are also called to be. Okay, so guys, I think you're doing a great job. We're almost halfway through. I see you very recollect during the prayer time. So I would encourage you to keep up the good work and to make the most out of this retreat.